Hey, it's Kim Gaffett. I'm the uh, OVF naturalist with the Nature Conservancy here on Block Island. And the perfect thing to do on a rainy Block Island summer day is to take a walk at the shoreline and collect things for drawing, for art and nature. And take them home. And I got a whole bucket of little things. Take them home. Hopefully they're all dead or you take them back right away. But we got some shells to draw. Yeah. And I'll put them out and then we'll talk about them. We have coins to demonstrate size which is something you always want to do when you're doing art and nature we even have the, i found this this morning you can tell it's been dead for a little while it's a blue crab it's got a lot of seaweed on it and uh and then we have some live things that we'll take back later so let me take off my uh, jacket and uh, we can get started we have today's art and nature artist guest is Josie Merck. Thank you, Josie. Yes, thank you, Josie. <laughs> and uh, and she's got, already started. <laughs> we got some cool stuff. So one thing you always want to do in art and nature is when you start your piece is to date it. Make sure the date's on it. And, uh, you know, any notes about the weather, like today, softly raining. And uh, you don't always get... Some things are easier to draw, things that are still, like these shells. And this is a little oyster shell. It's got some nice texture to it. They are growing quite well in the Great Salt Pond. And then we have a slipper snail shell, which if you're anywhere around the Great Salt Pond, there's lots of slipper snails. And the reason they're called that is because when you turn them over, there's like a little shelf in there, a little seaweed first, a little <laughs> shelf in there where you can slip your toe in there and it's like a slipper. Sometimes they call them boat snails because they can be like floating like this, like a little boat. So they are very interesting to draw. Source. Most people go to Andy's way for the claw hog. This is a little tiny claw hog, not tiny. Um, this one was found, it was broken open already. It's just beginning to get its little purple there. It's wampum color. And we even have scallops in the Great Salt Pond. And um, they have a two year lifespan, so usually they have a scallop season in November. And you have to take them when they're two years old because they're not going to live beyond that too much. And they also are quite beautiful on the inside. This one has a little opalescence coloring in it, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. And then this guy, this blue crab, we have many kinds of crabs, but the blue crab, you can always tell because on its carapace, it has these sharp points on each side. So it's very oval shaped with these sharp points. And these hind feet, they call them swimmerettes. I guess this one is missing. It's very flattened, like a paddle. Mm -hmm. So they're great for swimming, swimmerettes. And, um, like all crabs, you can't tell because this one is, has stock eyes. Look, it has a little slipper shell right on it. Oh, that's crazy. Yep, that's what happens. And this one has quite a bit of green seaweed on it. So he's been, it's almost like he's got hair or feathers. But the thing about, why do you call this a blue crab? Well, if I turn it over and you see the colors, hopefully, of this claws, you can see they have quite a beautiful blue. Oh yeah, look at that. And uh, like a lot of crabs, they have one that's more designed for crushing, just like a lobster. See that claw? It's got like molars instead of incisors. So that can crush things. And this one is more designed for cutting. It's a little bit sharper. Let's see, how can we show that? Yeah. Maybe like that. Yeah, there we go. There's definitely. Yeah, a little bit more like a, a pair of scissors. And a little seaweed growing on it. Yeah. There. But a beautiful color. And in real life, it's even more beautiful. Want to try looking at that one again, too? Yeah, the, uh, the crusher one? Yeah. It's got quite a wingspan here. I guess you would call it a wingspan. <laughs> you can tell where my <laughs> allegiances are. <laughs> so, great fun to draw. And once you start looking at things closely enough, like not all the crabs we have in in the great salt pond especially actually this is the only crab we have in the great salt pond that has these wide broad swimmerettes designed 
just for paddling and swimming. The fact that we have so many blue crab is a sign of how healthy our, our pond is. When I grew up on Black Island, we didn't really have blue crabs. The, the weather is getting warmer, so they're moving up uh, more, more northerly. The Chesapeake, of course, is known for the blue crabs. Uh, so it's warmer and we have clean water, so now we have blue crabs in the Great Salt Pond. And we have a couple of live critters in this dish. I'm not sure if you can see that. A little hard with the dark sand, but let's Let's see, see. I'll move this little guy out here. This is a baby horseshoe crab. Oh, wow. And it was just, he had, I, he was sort of buried himself down into the mud. And it looks exactly like a big horseshoe crab. <laughs> and look over here. We see, you can't even see. See how well hidden it is? Can you see oh, that? Yeah, oh, he's, he's trying to dig himself in. But I'll give him a little nudge out here. Splash him with a little water. <laughs> Clean him up. There they are. There's two little ones. Now this one is probably about three years old. Really? Yeah. You should maybe put the coin up oh, to yeah. for scale because so, so, uh, that's amazing. So that's three years old. Right. Look, its body's just a little bit bigger than a size a of quarter. quarter. Yeah, yeah, like a half dollar maybe. Yeah, and I, some of us, my colleagues and I have been doing baby horseshoe. We call them juveniles in the scientific world. <laughs> Juvenile horseshoe crab. Um, uh, surveys where we spend a certain amount of time, usually 20 minutes, and dig up as many baby horseshoe crabs as we can, and we measure them, and we see where they are on, on the size scale, and that will indicate a lot about how many we have and what age class. Oh, the guy's getting a little active. Yeah. yeah. So the smaller one, would you say? Um, old? that one might be two years old, maybe. Okay. The first year, they're tiny, 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 like. It's tinier than my little pinky fingernail, and uh, that's after a couple of molts the first year, and then the second and third up to five or six years. They don't re they keep molting multiple times a year as they keep growing. Mm -hmm. Molting is just a way of getting a new, since they are exoskeletons, since they just have their body grows but their shell doesn't. So once they get big enough, they have to get out of the shell just like growing out of a pair of shoes. You got to get a new shell, and uh, it will crawl. The animal will crawl right out of that shell, and and it'll have a new rubbered one ready to go. So, and look, we have something else in here that's moving along. Can you see that actually? Oh yeah, let me get him. That is a snail, and there's a lot of these in the stream area, and he's gliding on his foot. They call it the foot. It's a big muscle. You can sort of see it at the bottom there. And sometimes when you're at Andy's Way, it's hard to tell what is a a trail from a snail or a baby horseshoe crab. And he uses its antenna to sort of feel and see what's out there in the world, which way you should go. He's really on the move. And actually, the uh, oh look, this little guy's trying to bury in. I'm not sure I gave him enough mud. Yeah, this tray's not going to help him. I'm going to give him a little mud to a little extra. Let's go see what Josie's up to over here. I think you turned the page already, Josie. We missed the first page. I did because I wanted to get a chance to look at the swimmerettes, which I've lost. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wrote swimmerettes on blue crabs, mm -hmm. but we're going to have to look at them again. If you don't mind, no, Kim. I don't mind at all. I was too busy looking at the I underpinnings. Know, I maybe started with. I get so excited about how many things uh, I have. That yeah, I know. We get all. Is that the swimmer? This is the swimmer. Oh, sorry. sorry. It's okay. It's like a little paddle. This one seems to have lost part of its swimmer. Okay. But so that's a good like example said, of it. There. Yeah. Yeah. Those sort of feathery edges. Well, I think the feathery edges might be a little bit of seaweed. Okay. It's sort of like if you're familiar with a lobster tail, and the very end of the lobster tail, it has those thin mm -hmm. little flaps. It's sort of like that. So Charlotte, one of the words for drawing besides putting that is verso, as you probably know. So I started on the other side mm -hmm. of the scallop, and then Kim turned it over. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. then that's the other side. That's Didn't cool. do the oyster. Clam, top, and how to pronounce hog. 
Oh, clawhog? Just in case somebody didn't know. And this is its underpinning. So then I have purple. Mm -hmm. So those are just notes I'll and paint. The yeah. I'll paint in later. So that was yeah. draw fast paint later. And this was the slipper shell, right? No. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes, it is. I'm sorry. Okay. I yeah. can't see it from here. Yeah. A little tiny slipper shell. And sorry. that is actually alive, so I'll have to take that back. Oh, yeah. Exactly where it came from? Yeah, I'll take it back to Andy's way oh, okay. and just put the crab in there. And the, the slipper shells will stay. They don't move around much once they adhere to something. I mean, they can. They have a, They are actually a type of snail, just like our snail here. And it has a foot. Oh, are they really? That's what you should yep. consider a snail. Right? Because, yeah. yep. And uh, it can, if you look at it, usually you see a big pile of them, like several piled up on a rock. If you look very closely, sometimes you can see it sort of just moving a little bit on the rock. Ooh. And uh, they're a pretty cool creature. They, um, they can be either sex. And usually the, the slipper snails on the bottom pile of the pile are female and the ones on the top are male. And as the pile gets higher, the ones that are on top are now in the middle and become the bottom. They turn into females. So oh, amazing. Nature oh, wow. is really amazing. <laughs> Kim, um, does the seaweed impede or enhance the life of a crab? I would think it would disguise. It might disguise it somewhat. It's, uh, it's funny that it has so much on it. Which makes me think that he's probably spent a lot of time in slow moving water uh -huh. and warm water and mm -hmm. water that's near the surface. So in the shallow back shallow parts of, of Andy's Way, which is exactly where I found it. Hmm. And the migration route is up from the Chesapeake Bay? Well, I'm not Rapidly. sure about migration, but yes, the uh, their, their range is moving northward. Okay. So they are coming, they're much more prevalent, prevalent now in southern New England than they used to be and the waters are much warmer now than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Look at this guy. He's, they're all like jostling for the same hunk of mud. <laughs> the two, uh, let's see if we can get there's, it. There's the one, oh, two, yeah. and then the snail has gone over there too. Yeah, all in the muck. Excellent. So, lots of different snail types. I'm not sure exactly what species this one is, but there are lots of them there. One of the cool things, I'll try to show you the foot. Look how, I'm trying to pull this, let's see if you can see it. I'm trying to pull this up and it's got very suction-like. Like I'm really pulling on it. I'm gonna try to pull him off his foot. I'm gonna slide him off his foot, there we go. You can't see it, but when I put him in upside down, he's gonna stick his foot out, maybe. Maybe. You know how it is hard to work with animals and kids. Oh yeah, it's going to stick its foot out to try to turn itself over. Look at that. Look at that. Wow. Look, look how big that, that foot is. And now you really see the foot. Yeah. yeah. He's gonna, that's the whole surface on which he glides. He's going to do it. It's hard to not try to help it. I know. But. I think he did it, didn't it? I think he did it. Oh, there he goes. Because it is foot organized. Oh, we probably shouldn't be putting in the there sound effects. And there he goes. Off he goes. He's on his foot. And you can see how that foot acts as a glide. So, shall, if you wanted to draw the horseshoe crab, I could hold it in my palm so you could get a nice still photo of it or look at it yeah if people, if people wanted to they could just pause the video all right to get oh, a good screen video screenshot. Oh, a screenshot okay i'll mm. get the top look at that a little tail it's quite soft right in the eyes very on soft the, in the front those ridges right there yeah those eyes are kind of they're just bony protections that but they are about where the eyes are oh okay like and an it's, eye, though, doesn't it, Charlie? It's got a yeah, dot. Yeah, I think so. I know. Well, <laughs> their eyes are, are com they have two compound eyes, but they have up to ten additional light sensors, which they refer to as as eyes. Huh. And a little tiny tail. So now a horseshoe crab is a very uh, gentle animal. It does not bite. It does not eat you. It does not sting you. That little tail right there 
is just meant to help with its balance. Look, it's the same color as my hand. It's hard to tell it. Mm -hmm. Let's see if I change it around there, maybe. So it's sort of bent a bit. Is it bending yeah, up a bit? Yeah, it's because he's very soft. Yeah. He's very soft. And uh, I'm going to just turn him over for a second. Yeah. Let me get a see. Let's see if... Where's the best place to see? Oh, wow. There, there we go. go. So in here, those little things in there are the book gills. And that's how he breathes. It's, and in the middle, sort of that darkened area right there, I need a little pointer. Uh, is its mouth. Thank you. Right there. Okay. And its mouth isn't like our mouth. It's it's basically a grinding machine. So mm -hmm. anything it finds, like a little shrimp or a little, you know, insect or beetle or copepod, uh, what we call um, um, zooplankton, little tiny animals, it just grinds up and eats it. And then these feet, which he aren't very active on this one, are sort of lined up here, but they help it go along. And then the book gills are down here. I'm going to put them back down. That's sure. a little too much now, exposure. Now, that spear, how does that grow, or tail, or whatever I Is should that? call it? How does that grow, the spear? The tail? Yeah, tail. Um, it drops off and gets a bigger no, one? No, when it, when it molts, and you probably everybody's probably seen a molt, the, the tail is there. Yeah. It's just part of, it's just part of the whole the skeleton skeleton yeah. exoskeleton. The whole bony shell outside is one entire piece and the fleshy part is inside. And then it, it just, hardens when it Yeah, it has a new emerges. shell. When it has a new shell, um, when it emerges out of that, it splits. I won't be able to show it on this, but I'll sh show you generally. Let's get them. Little guy is slippery. <laughs> So right, right at this edge, right here. Mm -hmm. Oh, that lighter edge. That there. lighter edge. This is the upper carapace, and below is the lower carapace, right oh. there. And those will spread open, and the animal will crawl out and leave the whole shell behind with the tail and the gills and the feet and right. everything. And the new animal that is coming out, or actually the same animal, mm -hmm. having molted its shell, has a new shell that's very rubbery, um, so that it can be flexible um, when it comes out of its shell. And then it's, uh, it pumps a lot of water into its body cavity and stretches the shell out while it's still soft. And then it will harden. And so when it hardens, it's bigger than it needs to be. And I always say that's like if you were buying a pair of shoes at exercise so you could grow into it, so the horseshoe crab can grow into its new shell. But when they're little, they have to do that several times a year. Wow. It's pretty amazing. Upper and lower carapaces, right? Right. But it's still all pretty connected. Mm -hmm. So when you go to Andy's Way and you see lots of these, they're not this color. They're very beige light tan colored and they're not a dead animal they're just the shell so it's actually a sign of good health not a lot of dead animals it means that the population is so strong that the animals are growing and um, molting or shedding their shell and some are huge some are big yeah <laughs> they don't uh they stop molting after about eight to ten years when they become reproductive age that's it that's their size at least that's what we know now. I bet you they find out differently someday. That's the thing about science and nature. You only know what you know for the minute. Things are always changing. Mm -hmm. You get more knowledge because you can look at things more. But and what are the scientific tests you're doing with them, Kim? Um, the horseshoe crabs? Yeah, so horseshoe crab blood is very interesting. It's uh, it's, they call it blue blood because it's got a blue tinge because its basis of its blood is copper, not iron like our blood is red and iron. And they produce um, a, a, an amoebocyte, uh, something called Wimulus amoebocyte lysate. And it's a, uh, it's a protein and it is very reactive to, in, uh, to foreign objects and contaminants. So, actually, infection is not known in horseshoe crabs. Huh? 
they um, whenever they have an injury, the the LAL Lumulus Lysate mm -hmm. floods to the area and seals it off, so that it can um, it can protect and close off the wound. And so it's so reactive that pharmaceutical companies use it to test um, uh, vaccines and drugs and anything that goes in the body, including artificial joints, knees and hips are often tested first with uh, LAL to make sure that there are no foreign bodies or contaminants. And if you've ever had a flu shot, you've benefited from that uh, process because all vac flu vaccines are uh, are and have been for many, many, many years uh, tested and for, um, for their purity. And it's kind of a, a big generalization, but just think of a big vat of flu vaccine that's being made and you put them in a little LAL and if it reacts then they don't use that batch and uh, they know that it's not pure. And it, it might have contaminants that would be And dangerous. those poor horseshoe crabs, they are um, producing non-stop because it's needed right now. That's right. And they actually don't, horseshoe crabs do not do particularly well in uh, captivity. So fishermen who used to fish for horseshoe crabs um, are now can get paid by the horseshoe crab uh, to bring it in to the uh, to the uh, pharmaceutical company who will uh, take a blood sample, like a blood donation, and it, the regulation is that it has to be returned to its home site within 24 hours. Somebody's paying so attention, the, we hope. Right. So the, that is the protocol that I know that, believe it or not, I, I understood. So I do a little work with DEM this year in Rhode Island. Uh, they're looking at the DNA of horseshoe crabs in different parts around the island, I mean around Rhode Island, to see how closely connected the populations might be. And I asked, and they said about 20,000 horseshoe crabs get collected in Rhode Island a year uh, to be used to have the blood taken and then returned. And I, I was stunned that there were that many. Stunned. So. But I guess I'd rather have that than have them being used uh, there. Fishermen, if you're a fisherman is using it, it's usually a fisherman who's fishing for eels or conch, whelks. And they just put them dead in a trap and the eels or whelks are attracted to that. And, uh, uh -huh. So they are used for bait, they're not used for eating. Although in other parts of the world, horseshoe crabs are eaten. Um, Anyway, that's probably how way Yeah, how long ago was it discovered, their great pharmaceutical uh, use? It's amazing. You know, I don't know, but it's been, you know, I'm sure it's been decades. I mean, it's not a new... I'm going to go on the other side of you, Josie. Get your, I'm going to get another last shot of the sketchbook here. Do you want the old sketchbook or the new sketchbook? No. Okay. Oh, the old one. Do you have, um, do you have other ones you want to share? Well, based on what oh, Kim has taught us over the this. years. This is very old, but we have no tongues here today. No, we don't. <laughs> oh, these are some old sketches from Martin yeah. Nature. Oh, look at the dragonfly. That's Whatever great. is Kim brings us living things and we make our drawings and aha. Uh -huh. Well, the swimmerettes perhaps. Swim. Yeah. yeah, there you go. A version, yeah. Almost life size. Great. That's nice. Nice. Well, we'll have to plan on some yeah. future ones as well. Yeah. That's what Kim has been doing for us. Right? So I think, uh, I like I said, if it's a rainy day on Black Island, or even a good day, you can only go to the beach so often. <laughs> get out the get out the drawing and painting, and and start looking at whatever you find closely enough to understand what it what it looks like and what it's doing and how it lives. And you don't have to have just live things like these cool things. You could, so lots of great art right here and shells or plants or the dead fly you found on the table. <laughs> and you can use a magnifying glass too. Yeah, I actually usually have one, but I didn't bring yeah. one. Oh, you have one. Anything oh, yeah. you want to look at? All right, Kim, I'm going to wrap it up. Oh, All right, gosh, All right. thanks. Thanks, Josie, <laughs> thank so much. You. And thank you, Kim. Yeah. <laughs> See you next time.